All right, hey, my construction entrepreneurs. This is Tyrone Jones with the Construction Entrepreneur School and Services. Hey, this is how to become a California licensed contractor for 2021. This will tell you everything that you need from now, which is um, September 2020, all the way until the year 2021 and through the year 2021. Uh, we're on video 205. This is a five part series, so make sure. Uh, to go check out uh, video one if you have not seen video one. That way you can get this full content and know everything you need to uh, become a uh, general contractor or a specialty contractor here in the state of California. All right, let's get to it. All right, <clears throat> do I need to sign up for a contractor school? Okay, listen, the secret is out. Every school, I wouldn't say every school, but majority of the schools here in California uh, rarely produce their own material, meaning that they're rarely creating the, 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 the business and law uh, prep material, you know, the trade math material or the trade material. There's, there's one, two schools that are creating their own material. Okay, majority of the schools here, 97% of them, have, we all have the same material. We're all buying our material from the same publisher. So with that said, it's, it's, to me, it's all about the knowledge of the either the instructor or the person that's selling you to join their school. You know, where's that person background from? Is that person is just a salesperson? A lot of the individuals that's selling the, 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 the school tuition or the prep exam material with these schools are just salesperson. You know, like myself, I'm a contractor. I'm actually out here doing contract work. I actually have a construction company. I actually show the jobs that I do on YouTube, the jobs I'm going for, the jobs I lost. I talk about the ups and downs uh, contracting. Uh, with these other schools, it's just, you know, it's just, hey, bring you in. And then they talk about, you know, book related material instead of what goes on in the real world as a contractor. But back to the material, we all pretty much have the same material. There's no school out here that's going to cover every part of the test that's going to cover everything that you need to know to pass your exam majority of the things you know you should know to pass your exam that means that when you sign up for the school a lot of it the biggest part of it is the trade portion and this is the portion that a lot of students do not pass you know um of uh, the law and the uh, business portion a lot of students pass but the trade is uh is what hangs up a lot of folks but um, um, there's no way any school that's out there can train you and prepare you for everything that they're going to have uh, presented uh, at your, um, your examination to get your license. Please understand that. All right. We, uh, uh, um, okay. So the board, uh, each, each, each test, okay, so law and business and the trade test. I hear that it's seven different tests for the law. I hear it's seven to nine different tests for uh, any particular trade. What that means is that for the C8 concrete specialty license, there may be five different tests for that license. That means that every time you go and retake that test, five times you could actually get a different test. Now, some of the questions I hear is going to be on you know, a, a lot of questions are going to be, you know, you're going to find duplicated between uh, each exam, you know, but I hear that it's, you know, uh, seven to nine different tests, as low as five different tests, depending on what, what trade classification it is. So you definitely want to be careful with that. And this is why I, I say that no school can train you for everything that you need to know to pass this exam. <clears throat> and this brings me to the next thing. What are you studying? What are you studying on your own? This is why it's very important that you do study on your own. 
to help pass your state exam. When you go through the classes, whether it's with the Construction Entrepreneurial School and Services, my school, or what if it's another school, whatever you learn in there, you're going to have to take the initiative to, to, to start doing self-study. Okay, you're only going to learn a handful of, 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 um, uh, of information that you need to pass the exam. And some of it may not be on that particular exam. Remember, there's several, there, there's reportedly seven different, uh, uh, several different types of exams out there. So some of the information that you may study, some of the information that you may receive, you may not find on that particular exam that you take, okay? So you do need to study on your own, okay? What do you study on your own? You study information um, uh, about your trade. You study information about the uh, contractor's uh, state law. Uh, you go on the CSLB website and, and pull up publication there and, and, and find out what they're recommending for you to study. Also check out the, um, uh, if you have a particular trade that you're going after, look on my channel. I have posted uh, examination study guides, okay? I, and on that study guide, at the end of it, I give the, uh, the reading material that the board recommends that you read for, for that particular classification. Because each classification, the board is pulling not only information from contractors uh, to design these uh, exams, they're also pulling information from uh, uh, different publications, different books uh, uh, to create these uh, exams as well. Uh, and I, I know you, you did hear right. The board is using contractors of that classification. So they're calling in electricians. They called me in one time. You don't make a lot of money, but it's very exciting. Uh, uh, it's, it's something that you can share. They call you in to help design uh, exams for the particular classifications that you have licensing for. So they called me in to help uh, design a C8, the concrete. Uh, examination. Very interesting. Uh, they ask you about all types of stuff that you're doing in the field. They try to keep it, you know, narrowed down to where it can apply across all boards, all spectrums of work with that classification. So yes, you need to study on your own. So like I said, check out my uh, uh, examination study guide videos for your particular trade. I do one for each classification. If you cannot find your classification, then just reply to one of the classification videos that you would like me to do one for your classification, and I'll try to get to it, okay? Uh, make sure you uh, um, uh, put on notifications. That way, once your, uh, trade, once, your, once your trade examination guide is posted on my, on my YouTube channel, then, then you can go ahead and uh, review it then. Okay, so make sure you put on notifications once you subscribe. Um, so yes, you need to study on your own and you need to find out what materials um, uh, that you need to study, that they recommend, that the boards recommend that you study, okay? Uh, search the web for what you need. Yes, you need to search the web for all sorts of questions. Also, especially, this is also, you know, pertaining to if you fail, as well, you need to go back, you know, look at this video. There's some of the things that you may need to do if you do fail the trade exam, okay? That you need to search on the web on, that you need to uh, uh, find out answers to, things that you may not understand or, or that you may not know. You need to look up and grasp that so you can pass your exam on the first time, on the first try. You wanna pass it. Um, so the answer is yes, okay? You do need to sign up for a contractor school. Why? It helps prep you for the state exam. It helps you with, like, uh, I don't know if all schools are offering it, but your school should help you with your, your, um, your application, your original contractor application to the state board. They should be walking you through each process uh, all the way until you have to get your bond. Whether if they offer bonding or not, they should be able to help you, you know, the next step to get your bonding. Uh, 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 all the way until you get your, your, your contractor's uh, card, you know, and if you, and they should have other programs where they can help you land your first job, teach you how to estimate, you know, blueprint reading, 
different things to help you be successful within this industry, okay? So yes, choosing a contractor school, but choosing the right school, okay? Look at them, see what they offer. Uh, uh, there's one, there's a school here in, in California that's been around for a long time. I got my license from them years ago before I even started a school. They're, they're, they're all over uh, California. They get majority of the signups, okay? But look at it, see if it fits um, uh, what you need to learn, okay? See if it fits where you're at. You know, if you got to travel out a little bit to go to a particular office because there's an instructor there that you like that you can learn from, you know, research all those things to where you can get the full benefit of these classes. And you, once again, so you can pass your exam on the first try. All right, what experience do I really need? I get this call all the time, okay? Um, the CSLB requirements is you need, you need to be 18 years or older, okay? And you need to have four years of experience within a 10-year period. Four years of experience within a 10-year period. They require you to be a, a, a journeyman-like uh, journeyman -like level of experience, okay? Or management type experience, right? Um, um, they don't, you, you, there, there's some calls I got from individuals that are 18 years old, right? They're like, hey, I'm 18, I wanna go for my license. Well, um, that means that at 14, you were working because they require you to have four years experience. So at 18, it's unlikely for you to really get your license unless you have some concrete evidence that, hey, maybe it's your, uh, maybe a family member owns it. Maybe your mom owns the construction company. Maybe your dad, your uncle. And uh, you can show that you've been working steadily. Remember, for four years, just because you've been working for four years, you have to show that you have four years of experience, you know? Um, not that you worked a year and you only worked part-time because you were underage. So you got to think about those things. And they want you to be able to run a crew, uh, 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 show that in this time that you have, you know, been a journeyman level. So that means that you can delegate. You can tell people what to do. You understand different types of projects that you've been on, uh, doing different types of work. And of course, the and also dealing with the work that you're applying for, the classification of work that you're applying for, okay? <clears throat> Next, what if you've been working for yourself? This is huge, okay? What if you've been self-employed this whole time? What, I, I got individuals who've been self-employed for 10 plus years, okay? They got more than the four years that's needed in the 10 year period, okay? What if you've been working for yourself? So listen, you, if you're self-employed, you're, you're not the first one to get your contractor's license. But I tell you, there are an amount of applications that gets red flagged. And these are the individuals that's been self-employed that does get red flagged. Now, one of the biggest things that I see that cause a red flag on your application is that a lot of self-employed applicants fudge on their work experience numbers. And this is the reason why. So the board is asking for four years of experience, right? So as an as, as employee, you just put, hey, I've been working for this company for four years, this is the company name. Well, if you're self-employed, you have to actually fill out a form that uh, uh, gives the job information, the homeowner's name, the homeowner's contact, any permit information, uh, everything that you did on that job. I mean, they want to know up, down, left, and right, everything about that job that, that was performed and that, that, that was achieved and who they can contact to verify this. And then lastly, they want to know how long did that job last? So, so each form that you fill out, the time of each job, the total time of all those jobs needs to accumulate to four years. And this is where self-employers fudge their numbers. Instead of that job lasting two weeks, they put four weeks. Instead of that job lasting for three days, they put in a week and a half. So this is where uh, a lot of applications get red flag and time. And now listen, the board does understand that um, 
at this time you were operating without a license. Now you want to get your license. Now they do make it a little difficult because they're just not giving it to everyone that's self-employed. So they will be asking for permits. Why didn't you have a permit? Uh, uh, what does the permitting agency allow in your particular city? They're going to be asking you some tough questions and it's going to seem like you're going to run into a lot of obstacles but you have to push through. You have to, you have to be with a school that's going to help you get through these obstacles that the board is going to present to you so you can get to the next level. Okay. So yes, if you are self-employed, you can get your license. Is this a lot tough, tougher to get your license than someone that's been an employee for those four years. Okay. So there's different things that you can do, especially um, during that time is times where I have pulled up bank records to show evidence uh, to help individuals get their, uh, to get to the next step of getting their license. Uh, I've shown uh, payments to uh, su supply yards, uh, uh, receipts that I had individuals go back and achieve so, so we can show them that we have evidence so we can fight for your license. So get with a school, let them know up front, hey, I've been self-employed for the four years, can you help me? Do you have the experience to fight through the board in case I'm, de not, I'm denied because of my self-employment during this time? Okay. Uh, what if your employee paid you only cash? What if your employee only paid you cash? This is huge. Okay. There's a lot of individuals out there that has uh, uh, done a combination of self-employment and being employed, but getting paid on the table and just being employed but employment is all under the table, okay? So a bunch of that going on uh, and it's still going on now. Um, uh, uh, so this is tough, okay? This is a tough situation. One is that you're, you're working for an employer that's paying you underneath the table. So if you try to file for a license and use that person's license number, like, okay, so I've been actually employed but I don't have check stubs and I've been working underneath the table, right? Now, the first thing that draws a red flag to the board because when you fill out your application, it doesn't state whether you've been getting paid under the table or through a payroll check or on payroll. It doesn't ask any of that, okay? The application does not ask if you're on payroll. The red flag is drawn is when you, when you put that company on your application that you have achieved X amount of years through on your work verification form, they look up that company and see that they don't have any workers comp. Okay. Or they see that they did not have workers comp during the time that, that, that you're, that you're saying that you gained your knowledge or your experience from. Okay. That's where the problem comes in that then that gets that contractor in trouble because they're like, Hey, why would you have an employees if on our records it shows that you're following an exempt, that you don't have employees? And this is where it gets a little tough and a little gray area. Um, um, and, and it's just, it, it gets real bad. So uh, if you are getting paid underneath the table, you can still go for your license. It just gets even tougher for those individuals that are going to use the employer that has been paying them underneath the table. If you're not going to use the employer, then you're going to have to use your, uh, any work that you have been uh, doing as a, a self-employed contractor, okay? Uh, if you don't want to use the under the table employer, okay? That gets a little tough. So now, if you were getting paid underneath the table and your employer did have workers comp, they just never utilized it, right? Uh, it may come up, it may not. That's a risk that you're taking. You can fill out your application and then they can go to the employer, uh, uh, the records and look and see that they had, they had a workers comp during that time and issue you to the next step. That, could, that can go that way. Or they could dig a little bit more and, and find out that they were never paying any payroll taxes and things like that. Does the board have the resources for this? No. So it's a very small amount of applicants that, you know, that, that gets caught doing this red flag and then they dig in a little bit deep, okay? They do not have the resources to do that, but you still have to be careful and you want to be honest on your application and make sure that you don't put yourself 
in a position to where your application gets denied because you have lied. So realize what you're up against, realize what you're putting on there and understand what I'm saying. And if you don't, make sure you contact us so we can break it down for you even more, okay? Uh, what is the minimum experience acceptable? Okay, so now we talk about schooling. The board allows, uh, uh, I, I believe, up to three years of schooling. Now, why do they allow up to three years of schooling when you may have went through four years of schooling? Well, they want that one year. They want you to have a one minimum of one year of in-field experience, hands-on experience. They don't want someone that's just a manager been managing projects all their life. They want to, sh you need to show them that, hey, I have ran crews, I have done this type of job with a minimum of one year hands-on experience. Now, can your schooling counts? Yes, but it has to be construction related. And each, now listen to this, the schooling is a case by case basis. Just because you got four years, eight years, whatever, how many years that you're presenting to them with your transits, um, um, it, it's not necessary that they're gonna count the four or three years. So you have to be careful uh, uh, with that, okay? Uh, uh, you're gonna go in there and you're gonna think, I, we didn't submit a lot of applications thinking that we was gonna get credit for three years and only got credit for a year and a half. Uh, and that's just it, it's just a case by case basis. Uh, some of it doesn't seem fair and we have to take it up to different levels. Uh, uh, majority of it got kicked back and denied, okay? I don't know, uh, 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 the individuals that's handling this and why they've been, I feel so unfair at times, uh, but just this is just the way it is when dealing with the schooling, okay? You still have to have a minimum of four years experience within a 10 year period, okay? Uh, they, <clears throat> and, and, um, uh, and that's basically it. That's it in a nutshell there. Um, uh, you got any more questions in regards to this? Cause we get a lot of phone calls dealing with this, okay? Uh, make sure you reach out to us, contact us, number is right here at the bottom of the screen, and reach out to us, let us know, okay? Uh, matter of fact, call 844-917-8223, so that's 844-917-8223, all right? Jump to the next one, all right. <clears throat> Once I decide to, to go for my license, what should I choose? What, what type of corporation? Should I choose an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, or a partnership, or a sole prop, okay? Um, now listen, LLC, LLCs, uh, because of the housing crisis uh, years ago during, during a, a downturn in the economy, a lot of developers were uh, having LLCs. And during that time of having LLCs, they closed down a lot of those uh, companies. And, and because the corporate veil on the LLC is so strong, they weren't, no one was able to come after them for all the unpaid employees and subcontractors that they left behind as developers. So now the board requires uh, anyone that's trying to get an LLC to have an employer workers bond, okay? Uh, and then you got to have a liability bond as well. So you got to pull up some extra bonds um, to have just to have an LLC because that corporate veil is so strong that they need they need a place where they can go. They need some security or warranty against you um, in case you flake out on your obligations. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, more upfront cost that you need to do to have an LLC. Uh, with your license, but you can still have it. You just need to get some additional binding, uh, additional bonds so you can have that LLC under your construction company, okay? Also too, uh, let's talk about tax with the LLC. Depending on the elections made by the LLC and the members, and the number of members, the LLC will treat, the IRS will treat an LLC as either a corporation, a partnership, or as part of the LLC owner's tax return, meaning there'll be a disregarded entity, okay? Especially a domestic LLC with at least two members is classified as a partnership for federal income tax purposes, unless it files form 8832 and affirmatively elects to be treated as a corporation. 
for income tax purposes, an LLC with one, with only one member is treated as an entity, regarded, disregarded as separate from his owner, unless it files form 8832 and elects to be treated as a corporation. However, for purposes of employment tax and certain ta and certain exercise tax, an LLC with only one member is still considered a separate entity. So you have to look at it for tax. Now also too, let me add this for the LLC because I created an LLC with one of my partnerships. It was actually a, a partnership by the name of Western Rim, uh, Western Rim Engineering. We create a partnership and doing this partnership we were allowed to uh, manipulate the percentages of uh, profit, losses, uh, and ownership in the LLC. Now, S Corp, C Corp, you have to split it evenly amongst the, um, amongst the members, okay? That means that in S Corp, you have two members, it's 50-50. You have three members, 3.33, right? You have four members, 25% each. LLC, it can be 25 and 75. It can be 10 and 90 amongst different categories, losses, gains, um, and uh, voting rights, it can be, that percentage can be different. Uh, it doesn't have to be an even split with, only with the LLC. So LLC is good to bring in a temporary investor, right? You can bring that temporary investor in and temporary investor has 10% uh, of profits and zero losses. They, and someone else can, you know, the other two partners can split the losses to where it's 90-10. Uh, one partner only has 100% losses. So you can divide this percentage as long as it equals up to 100, it can be split amongst the partners, amongst the members in any fashion, okay? That's the great thing about LLC that I learned when we set up an LLC uh, uh, under, under one of my uh, uh, old companies, okay? S-Corp, um, a lot of us uh, become S-Corps, S-Construction, companies. Uh, what happens is we select to be a C Corp and then over after the year or before the year is up, we're elected to be a, um, um, an S Corp. Okay. Uh, S corporations are corporations that elect to pass corporate income taxes. Okay. Okay. S Corps and corporations that elect to pass corporate income losses, deductions, and credits through their shareholders for federal tax purposes. Shareholders of S corporations report the flow through of income and losses on their personal tax return and are SS tax at their individual income tax rates. This allows S corporations to avoid double taxation on the corporation income. S corporations are responsible for tax on certain built in gains and passive income at the entity level. So it's good to be a, 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 an actual S-Corp. A lot of construction companies, this is what we become, S-Corp. You want to avoid the double taxation, okay? There's no additional bonds or, uh, or anything that you need to um, um, uh, file or obtain to become an S-Corp, okay? C-Corp. There's no additional bonds or anything like the LLC that you need to achieve, that you need to get to have a C Corp with the CSLB, okay? You can just have a C Corp, but the C Corp is a double taxation corporation. A corporation is a separate tax paying entity unless it makes an election to be taxed as a S corporation, okay? This means a C corporation pays corporate income tax on its income. After, after offsetting income with losses, deductions, deductions, and credits, the shareholders then pay personal income tax on the dividends. That means this tax, once this comes to the corporation, once that money's paid out as dividends to the partners or the members, then it's taxed again at their actual level when they do their income tax. So it's double taxation on that money, okay? A uh, uh, lot of Construction companies do not do C Corps, but a lot of them sign up as C Corps because we don't know, and then we elect or automatically transfer over as a S corporation. Okay, partnerships. Okay, now the board will allow partnerships. 
But you have to understand that if the partnership splits up, that dissolves that contractor's number. Now, whoever is the licensee in that partnership does still get a license number. You don't just lose your, your license, but that partnership number is now dissolved. So that means that if you and I uh, uh, design a partnership, okay, and we go to the board and and we say, hey, we are a partnership, because you can select to be a partnership, okay? We're a partnership. The board sees us as one entity. So we split because of, you know, because you stole some money, okay? You hit a check or whatever. <laughs> um, and I decide I want to split this partnership up. Uh, uh, there's no like, hey, I can't just give the partnership to you and you run it. If I file paperwork the board to disassociate, the board dissolves that partnership. That partnership goes away. The person that holds the RMO that holds the license gets another number and then has a sole prop or creates another corporation, C Corp, S Corp, LLC, and then create and then gets another number. And then now you can start doing contract work. But that cart that partnership is dissolved. You can't just say, hey, I'm 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 getting rid of this and then I'm keeping it. It's no longer a partnership. Okay has to be the same members in there when dealing with the board, okay? Uh, partnership themselves are not actually subject to federal income tax. Instead, they're like sole props or pass-through entities. While the partnership itself is not taxed on this income, each of the partners will be taxed upon his or her share of income from the partnership, okay? So the partnership will not pay any income tax you will pay whatever you receive, losses, gains, you will pay that through your personal taxes as if you're a sole prop, okay? Uh, as a sole prop, when you get your, you can get your license being a sole prop. You don't, literally, you can go in and fill out the application that says, uh, my name is Tyrone Jones. So I say, hey, it's Tyrone Jones um, Corporation. If you have a corporation, well, we're talking about sole prop, I'm sorry. So it's Tyrone Jones uh, 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 Company. Tyrone Jones Construction. Now, the board will haggle you being a sole prop with a specialty license, okay? If you're a sole prop with a specialty license, your trade classification needs to be in your name. That means that if I had a sole prop, okay? Uh, uh, and I went for my license, and this actually happened to me when I first got my license. Um, I named my company, uh, I think I named it the Con something, concrete network, something like that, concrete connections or something. And the board denied it, one, because I could not call anything outside of my name, um, any other name, unless I had a corporation uh, and I was doing a DBA or things like that. They want to see the paperwork. So the only thing I could really call it was my name, Tyrone Jones Concrete Construction. And I had to have concrete in there because that was the license I had. Okay. So if you're an electrician, you know, they may actually put the electric electrical part in that name being a sole prop. Okay. They're real selective on names that you can actually do. So uh, uh, I think I chose like uh, um, uh, T.A. Jones Concrete Construction. That's the name that I went with. It's still there. T.A. Jones Concrete Construction. So uh, as a sole prop, you can sign up, and we already know as a sole prop, you pay personal taxes because you're no, you're you're not a separate entity. Okay, everything belongs in your personal account, so you pay taxes on that. Okay, you can't pass anything through anywhere. You are the one that's being held accountable for everything that you're doing, and you will be taxed as a sole prop for that company. Okay, let's understand that. So. Uh, 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 be careful on name selection when, when deciding a sole prop through the board, but it's all doable. Okay. Uh, that completes part um, uh, two or five. Remember, there's five parts to this series. Uh, I just dropped number two. Thanks for watching. Thanks for staying tuned. Make sure you share this with someone. Someone needs to see this share it with someone, make sure you like, leave a, uh, a comment. Let me know that you enjoyed this. Let me know it's a, it's a vast amount of information that you're learning from this. 
and make sure you check out the other series three four and five they're coming soon uh, uh and if you have gotten to the end of this you haven't seen video one go back go check out video one stop what you're doing go back check out video one even though you have, you have made it to the end of part two <laughs> All right, my construction entrepreneurs, I'm gonna let you go with that. Remember, hustle hard, then hustle harder. Catch you on the next one.